Hi, this is Doc Climey, CFL analyst on TSN. You're listening to RougeRadio.com. Welcome to Rouge Radio. I am your host, Tyler Bieber. How about that intro? Jock Climbing, CFL on TSN. He has to be happy after this past week of CIS football action. We will dive further into that as to why coming up this half hour, but first I wanted to introduce you to our new format here at Rouge Radio. And you may be wondering why Rouge Radio is on tonight, a Tuesday, rather than tomorrow, Wednesday. Well, to put it quite simply, we have undergone a little bit of a change here, and that change will bring you two days of Rouge Radio instead of one. Twice weekly for 30 minutes a show, we will talk Canadian football with you and our outstanding guests. On Tuesdays, we will have shows that feature content on the CIS as well as the CJFL. Well, on Wednesdays, we will bring you the very best in the Canadian Football League. And in case you are not familiar with who I am, my name is Tyler Bieber, and perhaps you better know me as the man behind the CFL-based Twitter account at CFL Daily, or you can find it on the internet as well at www.cfldaily.ca. And I look forward to bringing you content every week, and I hope that you enjoy the shows. If you have any questions or comments in regards to the show, please feel free to send me a tweet, again, at CFL Daily, or you can even send me an email cfldaily at gmail.com. All of our shows here at Rouge Radio are open to you, the fan, so if you want to take part in our show, please feel free to call in using the number that you see above the audio player on the web page here, or if you are listening by alternate means, you can call in at the number 1347-989-1127. Once again, that is 1347-989-1127. And if you have an account with Skype, you can also use that. So with that said, how about we dive into things tonight and welcome in our first guest. He is one of the brightest minds on Twitter, and you can find him at Ridley Scouting, as well as the website RidleyScouting.com. He is Kent Ridley, the creator of Ridley Scouting. Kent, I want to thank you for joining me tonight, and welcome to the program. Hey, I'm I'm honored to be on here with you. It's uh, I don't I don't know if you can put me as being one of the one of the brightest ones on the on the internet. Not everybody would agree with you there. <laughs> Well, on this show, my opinion, being the host, I think would go over quite well, and I like to think that our, our listeners out there would think the same thing in regards to what you do. So uh, you've been on the program before, and I'm sure our listeners are quite familiar with the work that you do, but if you wouldn't mind taking a little bit of time quickly here to refresh the minds of our listeners about Ridley Scouting as well as the other ventures that you are into in regards to the game of football. Uh, Ridley Scouting uh, got its start in uh, in 2003, and uh, primarily our function is working with um, with high school student athletes on their road to post secondary school, uh, and hopefully lining up uh, lining up scholarships for them, and or at least helping them uh, work through the process to get scholarships and, and move on, and uh, then. W- Four years after that, we also run our um, our annual CFL draft guide and uh, and publish that for for the fans, especially with that long CFL off season. It's it's usually a, a good time in the middle of the winter to to get back talking football and and get involved. So um, so we came up with the the CFL draft guide and uh, and we really uh, enjoyed some success with that and um, put in. Uh, some great time and met a lot of great individuals uh, through the course of that. And uh, you also have partnered up with Top Prospects. And uh, if you can just explain what Top Prospects is trying to do in terms of putting high school students and getting them off on their next, the next start towards college or university or even the CJFL or something like that. Uh, yeah, Top Prospects is uh, is run by Shamari Williams. Uh, he's a uh, former first round or first overall first round draft pick in the CFL and and current uh, Hamilton Tiger Cat. And uh, uh, what he's done is he's created uh, a database uh, for football and basketball players in Canada. 
uh, actually international, uh, but primarily in Canada. And uh, and what it is is a it's a location for for the student athletes to create a profile, uh, put their contact information, um, put their highlight reels, ha have everything in one spot. And uh, and colleges across North America use the site to uh, to review Canadian talent and uh, and uh, the the colleges themselves go to the site and uh, they, they can contact uh, the player, their coach, their parent. Uh, they can watch their highlight reel and, and kind of get get a feeling on, on who the who this uh, young student athlete in in, in football, uh, men's and women's basketball, and, and get. Just kind of get a, a a little feel for them prior to making reaching out to make contact, and um, we've seen some great success. Uh, we've had over over 300 uh, scholarships uh, come through in the last uh, couple of years, and we're looking forward to a, a great result here with the class of, of 2014. Um, and so, yeah, if you're a young young student athlete out there looking to make your your mark on, on on the world get a free profile on on top prospects. Now there's a third part to Ridley Scouting and top prospects, and it's a little bit of a new venture called Sports A. What exactly does Sports A do to help promote uh, what Ridley Scouting and top prospects are trying to bring? Uh, Sports A uh, is a brand new media company uh, set up by Patrick Yan, uh, a former uh, University of Toronto varsity blue, and um, uh, basically, they've come together uh, with with an idea and a, and a game plan to set up uh, reporting, um, video reporting, uh, written reports, uh, and, and really covering high school sports in Canada. Um, they're starting off with football and basketball as well, kind of following along the the line that that uh, that I've worked in, that Top Prospects deals with on a daily basis, and um, and they've got reporters from from coast to coast that are that are putting in the time and, and effort to to kind of give you um, a little more spotlight onto the athlete uh, that there is you know the the regular game reports and um, reports about how teams are doing and all that kind of thing but uh, but there's a lot of focus in on individual athletes and um, and really giving giving a, a chance to get to know these these uh, these young athletes. Uh, really give them some exposure and and the accolades that that they uh, that they deserve playing playing the sports that they love. Helping young athletes make it to the next level, perhaps in the CIS, and that's a perfect segue to get started here on our CIS recap of the week and things going on here in the league. And we're going to start out in the OUF conference. And uh, after 15 years away from the football field, the Carlton Ravens returned to the gridiron on Monday night as they visited the Western Mustangs at CD Stadium in London, Ontario. Now, obviously, when you're bringing back a program after 15 years away from the game, you're going to have some hiccups, you're going to have some struggles, and I think that's pretty much exactly what you saw with the Ravens as they were, went down to Western by a score of 71-4. to and I don't think it really matters what level of football you are playing in or even what sport you are playing in when you are playing your first game after a 15-year leave or or even your first game at the beginning of a new franchise, kind of like what happened with the Ottawa Renegades in 2002 and perhaps next season when the Ottawa Red Blacks step into the CFL. But uh, it's going to take a little bit of time. So, Kent, I guess the question here would be, how long do you think it's going to take Carlton to gain some traction on the football field and start producing results um, maybe not necessarily wins, but more contested football games in what is a very tough OUA conference. Uh, Carlton's in a in a unique situation, and uh, the schedule makers did them no favors uh, by setting them up with win, with Western as a as a first opponent. Um, Western had already had you know their their first game uh, with Toronto the week before. Uh, so they were kind of you know battle tested and, and ready to go. Um, it was Carlton's first game. Uh, putting them into that situation was was kind of a, a no win situation for them. Uh, on the other side of it, uh, the future is bright. Uh, their recruiting class is is, is one of the best. Uh, it, it's a lot of times you end up with a with a first year uh, franchise, a, a young uh, 
university program and you're, you're kind of picking up the, the scraps that, that everybody else, you know, kind of bypassed. But um, they went out and, and made a great move in getting Coach Samara on, on board, uh, fantastic coach, um, and, and he will be ideal in that situation at, at moving forward. Uh, and he was able to assemble uh, a great recruiting class. Um, you know, it, it, it never hurts to bring in a battle-tested quarterback to, to start from day one, and uh, Jesse Mills is going to be – he's going to be a, a fantastic OUA quarterback. Uh, he just needs needs to get back into it uh, and, and have the rest of the talent come alongside. And they've got some great work, uh, foundational work, done this year. And uh, so I, I do expect to see them competitive, even, even in games this year. Uh, next week they've got Waterloo, and um, that should be a little bit more their speed than – than uh, than Western, and um, you know I I look to see uh, some good things from them this year. Uh, I really see them next year uh, being a competing team. You know maybe not competing for playoffs, but but definitely a, a, a team that is uh, is one to take note of. And and I think in year three, I think that's going to be kind of the the year to watch and, and see what kind of noise they can make then. There were four other games in the OUA conference this past week. Uh, Guelph improved to 2-0 by defeating Windsor uh, by a score of 24-23. Ottawa got by Waterloo, 44-32. And as I mentioned in the opening, Jock Climey had to have been happy with one particular result in the CIS this past week, and that, of course, would be his school, the Queen's Golden Gale, who ended the 19-game conference winning streak of the McMaster Marauders by a score of 31-24. And then finally, the Toronto Varsity Blues, who knocked off Laurier by a score of 27-20. And sticking with that last game, Kent, that was the Varsity Blues' third consecutive win over Laurier. And I wanted to ask you how surprising it is to you that a team that hasn't had a winning season since 1995 and has had only 18 wins compared to 120 losses combined with a 49-game losing streak over that time. How have they been as successful against one team as they have against Laurier, who themselves are not exactly a bad team? I mean, they won the Vanier Cup in 2005, and they've been in the playoffs every year since. So how surprising it is, is it to you that Toronto has won three straight games over Laurier? Uh, it, it was a shock for me. I thought uh, Laurier would would uh, would take it this year, and uh... – and and Toronto proved me wrong. It was it was a contested game. It's uh, it, it's always fun when you see that there's always unique rivalries in, in college sports, where um, a team may not may not be you know world beaters uh, week to week, but they have a, a specific opponent that they they seem to rise up for, and uh, and that's kind of been the way it is with with Toronto right now. Uh, whenever they see those Golden Hawks, they Something happens and, and they come up with a, you know, a, a, a great performance. Uh, and this was another one. This was a very solid win for for Toronto, um, especially in the new with the new format uh, when you've got 11, 11 teams in, in a conference and you've only got eight games. Um, you know, you got to pick up the wins where you can, and and that's a big one for Toronto. So moving on to the Quebec Conference now, and another big upset of the week as the Bishops Gators knocked off the eighth-ranked Sherbrooke Bear A. Orr in thrilling fashion with a one-point victory, 28-27. And uh, I wanted to ask you a two-part question here, Kent. First, how is the loss going to affect Sherbrooke in the standings going forward, given the fact that they still have to play Laval as well as Montreal two times each? And how much of a, how much do you think the loss will affect their confidence and team mentality going forward? Is it gonna, you know, knock them down a peg losing to a team that had not won a game since the 2011 season, or are they gonna come out hungry this upcoming week here against Laval, trying to bounce back from a difficult defeat? Uh, yeah, they're, they're gonna come out hungry, but they are coming out against Laval, and that's uh, that, that's a tall task for for any team. Um, even at the best of times, uh, it, it really does kind of put that hiccup into their, their schedule. Um, this year, uh, the Quebec conference goes back down to, to eight regular season games. Uh, they had played nine the last three years. And um, because of that, uh, you know, Sherbrooke was 
uh, pretty consistently in the in the debate there for you know third and fourth best team in in, in Quebec. Uh, Laval and Montreal are are kind of in a in a class of their own uh, running the league right now. Uh, but Sherbrooke was a good team. Uh, they, they were the eighth overall uh, ranked team, uh, and and I put them in my top ten as well. And and here they go. They they face up a I guess the determined little uh, Bishop's University, the smallest CIS school uh, for football. And, and you know, like they say, you know, any given Sunday, and uh, and Bishops can can game plan with with uh, with the best of them. And when you got a guy like Jordan Heather, who has a, a phenomenal game, you know, fantastic um, game at quarterback for Bishops, uh, they turned it turned it into a win. There were two other games in the RFEQ conference this week uh, featuring the top two teams that we just discussed briefly here, Montreal and Laval. Montreal beat Concordia 48-3, to and Laval knocked out McGill 30-8. to And sticking with Laval, I just wanted to get your take. They're the defending Vanity Cup champions, and, you know, they've been a majorly decorated program since they won their first championship Jacques Chapdelaine in 1999. And I was just wondering what you think of Laval. Are they ever going to see a little bit of a decrease going forward, or are they going to be this powerhouse team in the Quebec Conference and in the CIS in general that just keeps winning and winning and winning and competing year after year after year? Uh, I, I don't think we're going to see um, uh, it, it be a decrease. Uh, for, for Laval to be beat, on a regular basis, it's going to have to be other programs stepping up uh, and, and competing kind of on their level. Uh, the real difference, um, Laval has more full-time coaches than any other school. Um, they've got fantastic fan support, of course, but they uh, also have a, uh, a drive that, that really aims at, at being the best program in the country. Um, you know, it's it's much talked about in CIS circles about the Laval Spring Training Camp in Florida, and uh, and the dollars that are invested into the into the the program, uh, even down to the marketing and the promotion of the team. Um, I, I think for Laval, you know, to to get knocked off, it's not going to be that they falter, even if they have a, a season where they they don't run the table or they they lose more than one game. Um, it's going to be because other schools are, are matching the effort that Laval is putting in. Right. So we're going to move on and round out the conference action here and head over to the West, the Canada West. And the Calgary Dinos were back up to their winning ways, knocking off the UBC Thunderbirds by a score of 41-31. And then we saw a game that absolutely lit up the scoreboard in Winnipeg as the Manitoba Bisons and Alberta Golden Bears combined to score 106 points as Manitoba became the first team to win a football game at Investors Group Field, not the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, but the Manitoba Bisons as they beat Alberta by a score of 65-41. Those 65 points allowed by Alberta were a near school record in Canada West play, as, but they allowed 67 points in 2011 in a blowout loss to the Saskatchewan Huskies. And speaking of the Huskies, they survived barely the Regina Rams this past week by a score of 40-33 to after they blew a 33-7 lead in the second half. Now, Kent, uh, most people seem to feel that with the departure of decorated quarterback Mark Mueller, you know, Brett Jones, among others, that the Rams are going to see a bit of a drop-off in results here. And I was wondering if you think that the comeback effort by the Rams is going to help bring positive steps with new quarterback Cayman Shutter going forward, or if the result is what it is, a loss, and perhaps a preview of what is to come for the program. Uh, no, I've, I've got a lot of faith in, in the Rams. Um, I, I had them in my top ten. And uh, I, I think the the graduation from from Mark Mueller moving from being the field general on the co- on the field uh, and turning into the coach for the field general, I think that that's gonna that's gonna take care of things in the long run. Um, the, their, their first half was atrocious, but uh, you know if they were playing a 65 minute game, I don't know if they lose it. Uh, you know, but of course you got a final gun at some point, and uh, at that point they were down. 
uh, it was a fantastic game to kind of follow along with. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, it, it kind of turned into one of those games that Twitter was invented for. Uh, if you're a sports fan on Twitter, uh, games that suddenly go from being out of hand in and turn into, uh, into a nice tight matchup, you know, kind of like the Labor Day game here, Calgary and Edmonton, um, you get uh, games like that, and, and all of a sudden you can just kind of feel that more people are paying attention. And uh, and hopefully the, the people that were watching online, that number increased towards the fourth quarter and, and, and into that. But, um, you know, you get, get a couple of good plays, a couple uh, taking advantage of, of some miscues from the other side, uh, and, you know, that result is, is flipped. Uh, I think I think Regina, Regina will be a, a good team moving forward, um, and and I think that they they can build on that second half that they had and and, uh, and really get some results. What did you think of those Saskatchewan Husky uniforms? They had integrity for a name plate on the back, and they had a little bit of an army look to them. Uh, I wasn't a, a huge fan. I really liked the helmets. I thought the helmets were great. Um, I know that. I kind of get where where they were going with the with the name bar thing. Um, Brigham Young is is doing a, a similar thing this year as well uh, down in the states, and and there's a couple other schools that kind of follow along with that. Um, so so that part, you know, that's okay by me. I, I understand how that fits into the program, um, but I wasn't a huge fan of the jersey. That's um, I, I don't know if I'd run out and buy one. <laughs> So earlier today, a new CIS top 10 was released, and once again, it was the Laval Rouge Or who were on top, sitting in the number one spot. Following them were the Queen's Golden Gales in second after their big win over McMaster. The Montreal Caribbeans moved up from fifth to third. Western stayed at number four after their blowout of Carleton. Calgary dropped from number three to number five, even though they did beat UBC. McMaster was able to maintain that number six spot despite their loss to Queens. Guelph remained in number seven. Saskatchewan moved up from nine to eight with their victory over Regina. Manitoba followed suit with Saskatchewan moving up from ten to nine. And the Bishops Gators, after their stunning win over Sherbrooke, go from unranked to the tenth spot. Sherbrooke themselves found themselves out of the rankings this go-around after being ranked eighth the last time. And then others receiving votes were Acadia, Windsor, Regina, and UBC. And Kent, was there was there any any differences in your rankings that you would have had as compared to the ones that were released today? Uh, well, uh, in, in my vote, um, uh, I, I couldn't have put McMaster in there uh, with the with their loss, and um, and instead, um, I, I always kind of save a spot there for the Atlantic, uh, and so I, I always have uh, whoever I think is the top in the Atlantic, even even though they haven't played yet, uh, and so I have a KDA in on my top ten, and um, uh, let's see, just going to pull it up just so I see it. Yeah, and I had Bishops in on mine, thanks to that win over, over Sherbrooke. Um, you know, it, but overall, it's it's pretty much the same school uh, between between my list and, and and what turned into or what was released as the official the official top ten. It's uh, it'd be interesting to see uh, you know how many how many of the schools are still there come you know about week five. Um, I think the schools that are sitting in the top five, those ones will all still be there. Uh, that bottom five is going to be the interesting part moving forward. And you mentioned Acadia. They have yet to play a game, as has anybody in the Atlantic Conference, and that Atlantic Conference will open up this coming up week as the Ask Men are on the road taking on St. Mary's, while St. FX will host Mount Ellison. And now we're going to switch gears up a little bit here and head over to the Canadian Junior Football League, and we're going to start again in the Ontario Football Conference. Uh, four games there. Windsor beat St. Leonard 30-20. to London topped Ottawa 30-27. to Hamilton blew out Burlington 48-12. to And in an overtime fashion, Twin Cities beat the GTA Bears 26-25. And then upcoming here this next week, it's going to be a battle of unbeatens as Hamilton has to go on the road to play Windsor. And then in the PFC, it was Edmonton beating Calgary in the lone game 32 to 22 
And moving over to the BCFC, West Shore Rebels won their first game of the season, defeating the Valley Huskers 40-33. to um, Not a lot of action this week in the CJFL, but Kent, I wanted to get a little bit of your take on a guy who set a record a couple weeks ago, and that would be the Vancouver Island Raiders head coach, Matthew Blocker. And uh, he recorded his 84th win in a victory over Kamloops, 37-27. And uh, just an outstanding job he has done since taking over. And, again, you can compare it kind of to what the Laval Rouge or have been able to do in the CIS. And uh, I just wanted to get your take on Coach Snoop, as his nickname is, and the job that he has done with the Vancouver Island Raiders. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a fantastic program. Um, they've, they've really kind of filled in a, a, a spot that, uh, that, that really wasn't there before, before they came along. Uh, they, they are taking players and, and, you know, traditionally junior teams, uh, have kind of a little more emphasis on, on players from around home. Uh, and then you get the Vancouver Island Raiders and, and they're just taking players. Uh, a lot of players, you know, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, uh, can find a home there. Uh, and they've set themselves up so that it's a, a program that players want to return to, uh, versus, um, a lot of the junior teams in some of the other centers are, are really promotional teams. Uh, they're setting up, they're trying to set up their players to move on. You, know, you take a Calgary Colts, for example, uh, and, and you see how many of their players bump up into the, the Dinos program or into one of the Saskatchewan schools. Um, but the, the Vancouver Island Raiders have, have their program set up in such a way that uh, it's helping kids get into school, that they're going to Vancouver Island University there. Um, they're they're really getting set up. Uh, they, they a couple of years ago they announced that they were creating a program that was helping out with kids going into trades, uh, and, and that's that's kind of a, a demographic that that the CIS uh, really can't match. Uh, if you got a, a a player with a with a future as an electrician or a pipe fitter, uh, you know these kind of things. Playing junior is is pretty much your only option if you want to continue playing playing football, and uh, with, with some of the, the junior programs, uh, they give you scholarship money after you've been with the program for a couple of years, whereas Vancouver Island was, was setting them up uh, right from day one. And, um, and so because of that, they've been able to amass a pretty regular talent stream, and, uh, but overall, they've run the program the right way, and they, they've built it into a, a strong, uh, strong unit moving forward, and I uh, for me, the, the most surprising thing uh, is that they've got two losses already this year. Uh, it's 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 always interesting seeing a, a program that's been strong for so long uh, when they have a little bit of a dip or when other teams catch up. And, and I think that's more of the case this year that you've got uh, an Okanagan team that now maybe they've got their sights set on on joining the the CIS, and uh, and you've got a Langley team that's that's um, really kind of developed the last couple of years themselves, uh, and they've put together a really strong core group. All right, Kent, we got to start wrapping it up a little bit here, but I wanted to thank you so much for the content that you have brought to the show and um, great stuff that you were doing. Again, if you want to see Kent on Twitter, it's at Ridley Scouting, as well as you can follow along with Top Prospects at Top Prospects CDN. There's also at Sporte and, of course, RidleyScouting.com. Kent, thank you very much for joining me on the program today. No problem. There he is, Kent Ridley. That'll wrap up the CIS CJFL show here on Rouge Radio. How are you doing, Canada? Thank you for joining us here tonight on Rouge Radio. My name is Tyler Beaver, and I will be your host for the next 30 minutes as we walk through what was a busy Labor Day weekend in the Canadian Football League, as well as some events that have occurred since. Did you happen to catch the Ed Hervey press conference in Edmonton yesterday? Wow. 
I think Simeon Rotier is still rubbing the polyspore on his wounds from the bus that he was tossed under by the GM of the Edmonton Eskimos. The Hamilton Tiger Cats unveiled new uniforms earlier this week as well, and they will pay tribute to their past as they will don the uniforms similar to that of the 1943 Hamilton Flying Wildcats this Saturday afternoon when they host the BC Lions. And we're going to dive further into that coming up this half hour, but first we're going to stick with those Thai Cats as they were in Vancouver on this past Friday night taking on the BC Lions. Now, it was a bit of a, not exactly a traditional Labor Day classic game, of course, given the fact that usually the Hamilton Tiger Cats are going to take on the Toronto Argonauts. But due to the fact that Hamilton is rebuilding their stadium, of course, they are not playing in Hamilton this season. They are playing in Guelph. And the Griffins, who is the CIS team there in Guelph, they were hosting a game on Monday afternoon, so that time slot was unavailable to the Tiger Cats to host the Argonauts. But the Argonauts were also unable to host the game because they had to wait for the Toronto Blue Jays to finish up their weekend series against the Kansas City Royals. So it made a little bit of a mess in terms of a traditional Labor Day Classic weekend as Hamilton, of course, went into BC to take on the Lions while the Toronto Argonauts hosted the Montreal Alouettes last night in a Tuesday night game. Now, the Lions and Tiger Cats, it was it was a little bit of a slow first half, uh, a standstill for the most part. The Lions managed to lead the game 14-9 to at the half, and then it, it continued on into the third quarter as each side, once again, was able to swap a touchdown, and the Lions had a 21-16 lead heading to the fourth quarter. Paul McCallum missed an early 45-yard field goal in that fourth quarter, while his counterpart, Luke Kanji, brought the game to within three points at 22-19. And then after that, the Lions were able to score on a touchdown drive as Travis Lule, with a timely touchdown drive at that, was able to guide them down the field, and he took it in himself from two yards out, and that gave the Lions a 10-point edge with over five minutes to play. Now, the next series for Hamilton created a little bit of a controversy as Henry Burris was looking to throw a pass out in the flats to Darren Diedrich, the fullback in the game, and it looked like Corey Banks hooked and turned him, and because of that, Diedrich fell to the ground, and uh, it, it allowed for Marsh to make what turned into be of course, an easy interception, and he returned at 31 yards, thus setting up the lines in good field position to seemingly end the game. But perhaps a little bit of karma on the side of the Hamilton Tiger cap in, in that regard, as on the next series, backup quarterback for the BC Lions, Thomas DeMarco, fumbled. He fumbled the ball on a second inches play, and that gave the Tiger Cats the ball back with two minutes and 26 seconds to play. Now, just just off base, going back to the DeMarco play, I myself am not a huge fan of having your backup quarterback come into the game. And there, there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, they're not in the game for a long time, right? If you're coming in as primarily the second and inches or the third and inches guy, you're only going to see the ball perhaps three to five times a game. So you're not typically used to handling those snaps, even though you may get some more in practice. And the other part is I'm I'm just a big fan of keeping your starting quarterback in the game because it creates a few more opportunities for you to perhaps, you know, if you want to extend the play a little bit, drop back and throw a pass or something uh, in that regard. And uh, going quickly back to what Ed Hervey, the press conference he had yesterday, he kind of mentioned it himself that he does not want to see the backup quarterback, Kerry Joseph, in the game in those situations because he'd prefer to have Mike Riley in the game. And, I mean, it, it, it does make sense to me. So I wasn't a big fan of seeing DeMarco come in the game. And in general, I'm not a big fan of seeing it, period. I guess the the situation where it would come up perhaps would be when you have a guy like Dan Lefevre in Hamilton who they have installed packages for. And he's been very successful in those packages, you know, running for touchdowns or else, uh, last week against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, I guess it would be this the previous week, not this last week, but the week before that, he actually caught a touchdown pass. He caught a touchdown pass from Andre Jones, a receiver. And those are the kinds of things that, you know, if you're going to use the backup quarterback, sure, you can, you can use him a little bit more, and he's going to feel 
a little bit more comfortable because of that fact. But uh, continuing with the game, the Thai Cats were able to march down the field after recovering the DeMarco fumble, and they scored a touchdown, but they took a little bit too much time off the clock. They were left with just 29 seconds left to kick an onside kick and then subsequently moved the football down the field and, of course, set up for a game-time field goal. Um, of course, the comeback effort came up a little bit short as Kanji's onside kick attempt sailed a little bit too deep and it went easily into the hands of the veteran receiver Paris Jackson and the Lions were able to complete a 29-26 victory over the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the non-traditional Labor Day Classic. Now, I thought the performance was a little bit more eye-opening to what we have seen from the Hamilton Tiger Cats when they were losing games earlier in the season to, say, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And that was a little bit of sloppy defense. Emmanuel Arsenal, one the Lions star receiver, he dropped a touchdown pass that would have gone for 95 yards and it would have given the Lions a 14 nothing lead. And perhaps, you know, it leads to a different style of game and ha- the and the BC Lions may wind up running away with the game, but of course that wasn't the case and Hamilton was able to stay with within the game for the most part. Um I myself have been critical of Hamilton Tiger Cats defensive coordinator Orlando Steinhauer and his play calling because I felt that when the team was struggling early in the season, they weren't able to stop opposing offenses. I felt that perhaps they needed to, you know, send an extra man or two a few more times and create various blitz schemes to help pressure the quarterback a little bit more because they simply weren't getting to the quarterback often enough. And, of course, when the quarterback is sitting back with all kinds of time to throw. He's going to find an open guy. I don't care if it's, you know, Anthony Calvillo or if it's a guy making his first career start as Tanner Marsh did this past week for the Montreal Alouettes. You know, they're going to find an open guy. And of course, that's going to lead to trouble for your defense. So I felt that they were a little bit pedestrian in the past in doing that. Um, Going forward now, of course, they did blitz a little bit more against the BC Lions. And I think that uh, you saw it lead to a little bit of chaos perhaps for their defense. Maybe they're not a little bit used to running those kinds of blitz packages and it led to a few open receivers as we just as I just mentioned with the case with Arsenal, a drop ninety five yard touchdown pass and then they found him again for another touchdown. Um Moving on to the offense for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, I think they have been doing a little bit better of a job running the football. And I I kind of don't think it was just the fact that they were playing the Winnipeg Blue Bombers recently. Um, Now, they only rushed the ball five times to running back C.J. Gable in the game, but he was still able to rush for 45 yards on those five carries, an average of nine yards per carry. I think if they may have ran the the, the ball a little bit better, and by that I mean a little bit more often, perhaps, you know, they keep the ball away from Travis Lule and... You know, the pace has slowed down a little bit more, and, you know, perhaps it leads to a win. Um, the other thing I think the Ticats can improve upon coming up here is what I was just mentioning about the packages they use with Dan Lefevre. Now, when you've watched the BC Lions in the past, they have struggled and struggled pretty immensely against teams that have used agile quarterbacks against them. And you look no further than the fact that Two of their losses this season are to the Toronto Argonauts and the Montreal Alouettes, who started in those games Zach Kolaros and Tanner Marsh. Now, Marsh didn't start, I suppose, but he did come in relief. And what did they do? They used their legs, they extended the field with their legs, and were able to get the BC Lions defense running all over the field. And I think coming up here on Saturday, when the Ticats host the BC Lions in the rematch, that you can perhaps find a little bit more success if you're the Hamilton Tiger Cats in using Dan Lefevre in the ways that they have been using him. He scored touchdowns running the football, and as mentioned, he scored the touchdown pass catching the football from Andrea Jones. So that was the game, 29-26, BC Lions defeat the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And now I'm going to take a quick break from the game recaps to talk about a question here that I received on Twitter. And the tweet comes from Kevin Kingsley, who you can follow at Argo Lifer. That's at A-R-G-O-L-I-F-E-R. And he's wondering about those uniforms I discussed a little bit before, and that is the Fine Wildcats. 
1943 Hamilton Flying Wildcats. They are going to wear these uniforms this coming Saturday against the BC Lions. And if you haven't seen the uniforms, the helmets are white, and they have the old Flying Wildcats logo. The jerseys themselves are are they're fully red, but on the shoulders and down the sleeves, they have black and white stripes. And then the team is going to wear matching red pants as well. And my my first initial reaction was, whoa. I mean, it's a little bit strange. You're used to the Hamilton Tiger Cats wearing black and yellow, right? And here they're going to come out wearing red. Red, white, and black. And it reminded me a little bit of the 2010 season when the Saskatchewan Rough Riders used their 100th anniversary uniforms to pay a little bit of a tribute to their past. And those uniforms were black, silver, and red. And, of course, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders are, no, are known for wearing their green and white. So it's a little bit of a culture shock initially, but I, I do like the Thai Cats uniforms a lot better than the Saskatchewan Rough Riders uniforms that they wore in 2010. But I, I like the I like the clean-looking black and yellow that the Thai Cats usually wear week to week. Um, I think it's always interesting to see the reactions to the uniforms because these teams do sell the jerseys in stores, whether it's on CFL Shop or in local stores in, in those cities. And uh, you've seen that with the Blue Bombers. They're going to unveil some new third jerseys this coming Sunday against the Sus- the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, uh, a little bit similar to what they have worn in the past with a little bit of a lighter blue. And then, of course, the slick-looking gunmetal black jerseys that the BC Lions wore a few weeks back. But uh, speaking of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and Winnipeg Blue Bombers, we're going to move on now. They played their annual Labor Day Classic this Sunday afternoon. Uh, Winnipeg started out the game as they usually have, you know, fairly decently. They may not always score a whole lot of points, but they usually are able to hold their own with their team in the first half. And we saw that. I mean, they led the game 18-14 at the half on the strength of what was a fairly solid first half from their starting quarterback, Justin Goltz. And he only threw three incompletions in that first half. And at one point in that first half, Winnipeg led by 10 points. Now, their struggling defense was incapable of keeping that lead at 10 points as the Riders came right back and made it back to a three-point deficit. But uh, going forward in the game, as has happened in the past, again with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, their second half. And I don't know what it is. I mean, you let Gary Croton go, the offensive coordinator, and the offense still can't score points in the second half. Now, that's not to say Marcel Belfay is doing a terrible job as the offensive coordinator because I think he has done some good things for them. You know, he's he's changing up the launching points. And, and what the launching point is basically is just where the quarterback throws the football, right? Because if you're dropping back to pass all the time and throwing it in the pocket, you know, you're not always going to be successful. So you have to move the pocket a little bit, get the quarterback running outside where he can, you know, see the field, see the play develop a little bit more, see the field a little bit more, and make a better throw. Uh, I thought that, you know, Justin Goldswood got into a little bit of trouble in that second half in that regard, though, as one of his two interceptions that he threw, he was rolling right, and uh, for some reason he decided to throw it back across his body. And when you're a quarterback and you're throwing it across your body, it's usually going to be trouble. And as was in that case, it was tipped and it was intercepted. But uh, for the eighth straight time, the eighth straight time, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers failed to score more offense in the third quarter. They have scored two points, two points since week two this season. That is absolutely atrocious how you can score two points in the third quarter for eight straight games is absolutely beyond me uh, the riders were able to extend the lead to 24 18 because of that fact and then as you rolled into the fourth quarter they scored on Early on in that fourth quarter, as Darian Durant found Taj Smith on a crossing rope, and again, it was it was something similar that you saw the entire game. Taj Smith crossed the field, I'm guessing at least four, 
maybe five times on that same route, and nobody was able to stop him. And on that particular play, it was Jovan Johnson, who was the most outstanding defensive player in the league a couple years ago. And they're still not able to stop it, even though they have one of the guys who won a league award for his defensive play in the past. And uh, the following series after that, after the Taj Smith touchdown, you saw one of probably the strangest, but also probably the one of the best plays of the season, as Justin Goltz, he dropped the snap, but he was able to pick it up. And when he picked it up, he looked up, and the field was wide open. There was nobody in front of him. And he took off for a 46-yard touchdown that brought the Bombers back to within six points. And Goltz afterwards in the postgame described the play as the parting of the sea. And uh, I thought it was reminiscent to a play similar in 2007 when then-starting Saskatchewan Rough Riders quarterback Kerry Joseph split the Winnipeg Blue Bombers defense on Labor Day. And with very few time, very very few seconds left, excuse me, scored a game-winning touchdown to lead the Saskatchewan Rough Riders to victory in that game. Um, after that, the Riders started to pile it on. After the Golds touchdown, the the Bombers moved the ball for just 11 yards. 11 yards after that Golds touchdown. 11 yards. And again, it's back to the same thing that you have seen from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. It's the same old, same old, whether it's offense or defense. And I think part of their problems defensively is they start to just run the same thing. They barely blitz. The the offense, excuse me, knows what's coming. And if if you know what's coming at you, you're obviously going to be able to find the holes in the defense. And I think they've gotten into a little bit of a hole, and they're a little bit, you know, I don't want to say comfortable just because the defense has given up so many yards, but I think they're comfortable running the same thing, and it's just not working. Now, whether Tim Burke needs to grab a little bit more hold of what Casey Crehan is trying to do and instill packages to help better, you know, be more aggressive, I don't know what it is, but something has got to change. I mean, you're still not lost in this season. Obviously, it's going to be a hard hill to climb for them to make the playoffs, but it's still not lost. It is still there. So that was the game. Saskatchewan ran up the score in the fourth quarter. They scored 24 points in that fourth quarter to run away from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, and the final score there was 48-25 as the Riders won their ninth straight Labor Day Classic game over the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Monday night saw a traditional Labor Day Classic game. We were without the doubleheader this year, of course, due to the stadium issues we talked about earlier. But it was the Edmonton Eskimos and the Calgary Stampeders, and for the longest time in this game, it was a blowout. And if you stepped away after the third quarter, you missed probably the most exciting 15 minutes of football you have seen in a long time. Calgary led this game 30-7 to after three quarters. Kevin Glenn got hurt, but when he was in the game, he played well. He threw eight, pass, eight completions on 11 attempts for 108 yards and one touchdown. But Bo Levi Mitchell came in the game, and he helped you know, continue the offense, throwing 11 completions for 18 attempts, 226 yards and two touchdowns. Maurice Price, the Offensive Player of the Week, announced today, Maurice Price had 165 yards in that game and three touchdowns. And possibly the back-breaking touchdown. Now, you wouldn't think it, but at that time, as it turned out, the game was just beginning. Price scored on a 66-yard touchdown where he ran away from the defense and the Calgary Stampeders led 37-7. to Now, I was wondering why Mike Riley was staying in the game You were down 30 points. He's been beaten up time and time again in the game. Why is he still in the game? There's there's 10 minutes left. You're only going to get him hurt. You play the Calgary Stampeders on Friday. But as it turned out, the decision to leave Riley in the game paid off as he threw a 35-yard touchdown pass to Kerry Coke, and then the lead was 37-14. Excuse me, 37-13. They went for two points, but it failed. Um, They got the ball back. 
Riley threw an 18-yard touchdown pass to John White, and the score was 37-20. Now, there's four minutes and 38 seconds left at that point, and you're thinking, well, they still have to score 17 points. But they have to get the ball back at least three more times if they're going to have a chance to tie this game. But sure enough, they recover a quick short kick. Riley finds Matt Carter for a 33-yard touchdown pass, and all of a sudden, the Edmonton Eskimos are 10 points back. And then the unthinkable happens. Jabari Arthur has a first down. He fumbles the football. Edmonton recovers. Fred Stamp, seven-yard touchdown reception. One play later. And it's 37-34 with two minutes left in the game. But it wasn't quite on the side of the Edmonton Eskimos after all. They did get the ball back with about a minute five left on the clock. Mike Riley was sacked on that first play of that drive by Charleston Hughes. And then he completed a third and 20 pass to Nate Kuhorn. And at that point, you're thinking, okay, they're going to do this. They just completed a 43-yard pass on, on third and 20. But it wasn't the case. As on a third and three play at the Calgary 53, they went downfield looking for Fred Stamps. And the ball was knocked away beautifully by defensive back Brandon Smith. And the Calgary Stampeders escaped with a 37-34 win over the Edmonton Eskimos. Now, that rematch is going to be coming up here on Friday as Edmonton will host the game this time. And uh, the 23-point third-quarter deficit for the Edmonton Eskimos almost joined some history, and it went back to, as I just mentioned in the Riders and Bombers recap there, a, a play by Kerry Joseph. In 2005 on Canada Day, the Ottawa Renegades were down 23 points to the Montreal Alouettes, 33-10, to 10, heading into the fourth quarter, and the Renegades, led by Joseph, came back to win that game 36-33, and that stands as the third largest deficit overcome after three quarters in CFL history, and Edmonton nearly matched that. Now, yesterday, Ed Hervey, general manager of the Edmonton Eskimos, a 1-8 football team, came out, and he didn't hold anything back. He said he's done watching it. He's had enough. And it's time for change. Now, He's not going to fire Cavis Reed. That's not going to happen. He said they will evaluate that at the end of the season, and you have to think there's almost a guaranteed chance that Cavis Reed will no longer be the Edmonton Eskimos head coach, which is interesting because a couple weeks into the season, Cavis Reed was given an extension. He was given an extension by Ed Hervey, a contract extension after they lost to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders to uh, go to 0-1 on the season. He was given an extension. Not exactly the kind of confidence you look for in your head coach when you lose your first game of the season. You know, so the biggest thing of the press conference was his critical comments about one particular Edmonton Eskimos offensive lineman, and that was Simeon Rotier. Now, he... You know, he didn't dance around it. He came out and said that his frustration has been with Simeon and that he's not living up to the expectations. And then he dropped this bombshell. It would not bother me if he didn't play another down this year. It wouldn't bother him if Simeon Rotier didn't play again this season for the Edmonton Eskimos, and I'm guessing if he didn't play again ever, which begs the question, why don't you trade him or why don't you release him? And then Ed Hervey goes on to say that he's a non-import offensive lineman and you have to hold on to them because of the ratio. But if he's not good enough to play and he's not good enough in your opinion that you want him on the field, what difference does it make? Sign a new free agent. It's the same thing if you sign a Canadian free agent offensive lineman, isn't it? The ratio isn't going to change just because you release Simeon Rotier. You're still going to have the same ratio. Why not release him? But that doesn't seem like it's going to be the case with the Edmonton Eskimos. So they're off to their worst start since they went 1-10 in 1971. They're, they're home this Friday to Calgary. 
Um, they clearly need help. You know, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I I don't know. They may get a Darius Bowman back, but I I don't know how much that's going to help a team that is struggling terribly to protect their quarterback, which they are. By the way, in that fourth quarter, Mike Riley threw four touchdown passes. One of the greatest fourth quarter performances you're going to see. CFL, NFL, it doesn't matter what it is. An absolutely outstanding performance, and he helped. He threw 33 passing yards through three quarters. He threw over 200 yards in the fourth quarter. Just an incredible comeback performance from Mike Riley that, of course, ultimately fell short. And I saw a tweet um, after the game that said something similar to the fact that a comeback is just that, or a comeback loss is just that, a comeback loss. It's not a win. They're one and eight. So moving on to the final game of the week, last night, a Tuesday night game, the Montreal Alouettes and the Toronto Argonauts as they started young quarterbacks, Tanner Marsh on the side of the Montreal Alouettes and Zach Kolaros on the side of the Toronto Argonauts. Marsh, of course, starting in place of Anthony Calvillo, who, by the way, the Montreal Alouettes placed on the nine-game injured list today. Now, you have to think that his time may be done. It's a concussion. He's in his 40s, heading into his 40s. And, you know, you just have to think it's time. And it's it's really unfortunate because Anthony Calvillo is such a decorated player, and he's so talented when throwing the football. And it's it's truly a shame to see a guy go out like that. But uh, it is what it is, I guess. And uh, in that game, Tanner Marsh played decently, a lot better than he did the previous week in relief against the BC Lions. He still won that game, of course, but he didn't make nearly as many mistakes as he did against the Lions. He only threw one interception against the, against the Toronto Argonauts as opposed to the four he threw against the BC Lions. Zach Kalaros for the Toronto Argonauts, he, he was okay. You know, it wasn't the performance that we saw him play against the BC Lions. Um, the game as a whole, really, I mean, let's be honest, it, it was not. Ex- if you missed the game, you didn't miss much. Toronto led 8 nothing after the first quarter, and then it was all Montreal after that, outscoring the Argonauts 20-1 to the rest of the way, as the Montreal Alouettes improved to 4-5 and on the season with a 20-9 to victory over the Toronto Argonauts. Uh, now, Montreal is tied with Hamilton at 4-5 and five for second place in the East. One game back of the Toronto Argonauts. And you have to think it's a bit of an advantage for Hamilton. Montreal does not have Anthony Calvillo. Toronto doesn't have Ricky Ray. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers seemingly aren't going to win a game for who knows how long. It seems like the Hamilton Tiger Cats have found themselves in the perfect situation. They may just walk right in and take this East Division. But, again, it is the Canadian Football League, and anything can happen, of course. In that game, the Alouettes drew on a strong performance again from Jerome Messam. 61 yards rushing on 10 carries. He has been outstanding for the Alouettes in these past two weeks and has been a huge part of their their back-to-back wins here over the BC Lions and Toronto Argonauts. So it'll be interesting to see going forward how Tanner Marsh does for the Montreal Alouettes and if Zach Kalaros can bounce back with the Toronto Argonauts. And uh, that's going to wrap it up here tonight on the CFL show of Rouge Radio. Thank you so much for joining me once again. My name is Tyler Bieber, and you have yourself a fantastic night.